Welcome back in the seventh video of the power supply repair series as done by the donkey himself. Today we're gonna look at the basic idea behind pulse width modulation, which is one of the cornerstones in every modern switch mode power supply. In addition to this, we're gonna also discuss things like periodic functions. Finally, we will discuss the shape of a pulse width modulation signal and different properties of the pulse width modulation itself. This will include the period, the frequency, the duty cycle and of course the pulse width. At this occasion I would like to thank you all for watching my videos. I would like to wish you a happy new year. I hope you are full with energy now. I actually intend to do a couple more videos this year. I should really spend a bit more time on this channel. So then let's go and do it. In the last video regarding linear power supplies we have used this very simple circuit and I hope I'm pronouncing circuit this time a little bit better. So the main idea was that we have a 12 volt DC power supply and we have an incandescent light bulb. After we press down this switch here we're gonna have a current flowing through the circuit and due to this current the filament gonna heat up and the lamp gonna emit light with full brightness. In order to limit the light output of this lamp here and to make it to put out only half of the light, what we did in the case of a linear power supply is that we used a series resistor and then the functionality of this resistor is that practically it just dissipates the extra amount of power on in this case half of the power in form of heat so my lamp is receiving only the remaining half of the power. Then we have replaced the resistor with a transistor and then we also introduced a Zener diode which is providing a really smooth so called reference voltage. Based on the feedback from my subscribers I'd like to avoid repetition as much as possible. So if you are not familiar with this basic linear circuit please watch my previous video. Keep in mind that this transistor here is still just a glorified series resistor. This is still just a linear regulator where instead of a fixed resistor value I'm using a transistor as a variable resistor and then we are dissipating the heat on the transistor instead. This means that in the case of a linear power supply we're gonna always have such a series resistive element and it is irrelevant whether this resistive element is a real resistor or whether it is any type of a transistor at the end of the day we're gonna still just dissipate a large amount of power on this series element and that power is clearly just lost as heat. Now due to this heat what we dissipate linear power supplies tend to be first of all really hot and also they are very inefficient since we always lose a large portion of the power in real life terms. This would mean that let us say as an example here you are having your salary coming in and suddenly you have to pay 50% tax and then you receive only 50% of your money. I think we can all agree that that is totally not cool. Since the linear power supplies turned out to be kind of a dead end for high power applications, now we are back to the drawing board with this very same circuit what we have just used to start. So now we are facing the same challenge how could we limit the amount of power and regulate the amount of power going through this lamp. At this stage we should recall what happens when we gonna push down the switch here. The filament will have a little bit of delay before it reaches its full brightness due to the heat capacity. After releasing the switch it also takes a little bit of time until the filament cools down. So how can we take advantage of this small delay here is the following. We can just simply press the switch for a very short period of time down which means that the filament will start to heat up but before it would reach its full brightness right before it we're gonna release it so then the filament gonna start to cool off. And of course before it would cool off again we're gonna press down the switch to heat it up a little bit. So practically this means that we need to toggle the switch on and off really really fast in a quick succession. If we would like to visualize the motion of the switch then we can use here this figure where as an example let us assume that when the switch is in open position then it is up and then when we press it down then the switch goes down then it stays in this down or on position in this case for a short amount of time. 
then we again gonna release the switch and we play the same game over and over again. So now let us try this principle in practice with a mechanical switch. Then I'm gonna first of all push it down fully so we see what is the full brightness. Okay, now I'm gonna release it and now I'm gonna start toggling it really fast. And as you might be able to see, indeed the lamp is not emitting light with full power, I was able to show you that this idea totally works in practice. However, another thing which you have definitely noticed is that the lamp is still blinking and that is because I'm simply not able to push the switch so fast. Namely, if you know as an example in the cinema, whenever you receive more than 24 to 30 frames per second, then for the human eye one cannot see this vibration anymore. And that is clearly an indication that whenever we are dealing with pulse width modulation, we have to use a high frequency. Since we are pressing down the switch for a short period of time only, what is also being referred to as pulsing the switch and this is why this whole method is called pulsing or pulse width modulation later what we will see because we can even modulate the amount of time when we press the switch or when we release it. Another important major difference compared to the linear power supplies is that please notice that here we are not using and I have to emphasize this here we are not using any kind of resistive element, but here we are really using the switch as a switching element in order to regulate the amount of power flowing through the circuit. Before we will dive deeper into the whole concept of pulse width modulation, first of all we should speak about some of these really basic concepts like what is a periodic function or even what is actually a period in electronics and of course what is now the frequency of a periodic function. Since we are talking about pulse width modulation, we have to look into what is the pulse width itself as a concept and what is the duty cycle of a pulse width modulation signal. As an example, if you are living in a country where there are four seasons, most probably you are used to it that you always go from spring through summer, fall and winter and then this whole thing gonna repeat itself over and over again throughout your lifetime. Since these changes in the four seasons always happen one after another, then we can say that this is now a kind of periodic function. Then we can look into how long does it take for this function to repeat itself. Of course, obviously it gonna take one year. So it means that the period itself in this case is one year. And that is because we need one year for all this thing to repeat itself once from the beginning to the very end. Now one year is a really long time, so we rather tend to think instead in terms of weeks, where of course we start from Monday, we go through all the days of the week, we are doing our job, then finally we get a little bit of break, and then bam, it just starts over again. In the case of a weekly routine, the amount of time needed to repeat this whole cycle is of course a week, so we can say that in this case the period is one week. If we would just think in terms of a day, then this would be our daily routine here of course, and the period itself would be again a shorter amount of time, it would be only a single day. What I wanted to convey to you in this slide was, that whenever we have such a process which repeats itself taking the same steps, then we can kind of model that process as a periodic function. Now the period itself is the amount of time how much it takes for one of these processes to go through a full cycle. In the previous videos we have already spoken about AC voltage, namely AC line voltage, and we have mentioned that it is a sinusoidal periodic function. As we have mentioned, whenever we look at a spring which is vibrating, it does the same type of motion, just a AC sine wave, namely it starts out at zero. So if we are having now on this scale the amplitude of how much we are moving the spring, and at this axis we are now showing the time, the spring would swing down to a negative value, then it would go back through the zero, 
to a positive value and then come back to zero again and then from this stage the whole thing just repeats itself over and over again. The process of starting from zero, going through the negative value, going through the zero, up and then back to zero again, is then what we are calling a cycle in this case. As usual, the amount of time, how much it takes to finish a full cycle, is the period. Most probably you will know that in Europe the line frequency is 50 Hz, whereas in the US it is 60 Hz. What does this actually mean or how do we interpret this hertz or how can we translate it in terms of period? It is relatively easy to understand the concept of frequency if we ask ourselves questions like as an example, how frequently do we celebrate a new year? We're gonna celebrate it once so we can say that the frequency of a new year event is one per year. We can again ask questions like, okay, then how frequently do we have a new week per year? And we have more or less about 50 new weeks in every year. And in terms of days, how frequently do we have a new day? We have about 355 new days in every year. So which one of these three is a more frequent event? It is obvious to see that we're gonna have 355 new days per year, so it means that this is clearly a more frequent event. So the frequency is nothing else but the number of full cycles or what we introduced previously we call them periods over a given amount of time. So what we have used here as an example, the amount of time we used here a year and then we see that the number of new days is more frequent event because we have 355 of them. So this is one of the periods here. We have 355 periods a year. So we could say that the frequency is 355 days per year. Now in terms of electronics we are dealing with different processes where this period is a lot shorter so we cannot really think in terms of years like what we did here which means that we need to take now a shorter amount of time what we use as base time. As base time we're gonna use a second in electronics and then we're gonna look at within a second how many times do I fully carry out a cycle or period? The number which shows me how many periods or cycles do I have within a second, this number is what we call hertz or hertz as you like to pronounce it up to you. As an example, when we are talking about a frequency of oscillation of one hertz, what we mean by that, we have a full cycle finished within one second. In the case of 50 hertz, what we just mentioned for the line frequency of the AC voltage in Europe, that means that we have now 50 cycles completed over a single second or in the case of audio signals when we are talking about kilohertz in the case of one kilohertz sine wave 1000 cycles which are then finished within a second which means that this is really really quick. Coming back to this 50 hertz line frequency this means that we have now 50 full oscillations finished within a second. So if we would like to calculate how long a period actually takes in the case of a 50 Hz line frequency, then we're gonna see that we need to divide one, namely one second with 50 because we have 50 Hz. Our period is only 0.02 seconds and this is here of course what I'm showing. Whenever we are dealing with audio applications, then the frequency of the signal will be in the range of several kilohertz. The kilo in electronics stands for 1000, so it means that we're gonna have 1000 periods over a single second. This means that a period gonna be only 1 over 1000 second long, so it is only 0.01 second. And as you see we have so many O's here or zeros as you wish to call them, that actually it is easier to express it in terms of milliseconds and the M stands for milli and S is just for seconds. 
When we are talking about radio frequency applications, then it means that most of the time we are already in the megahertz or in some cases even in the gigahertz range. The mega stands for a million, so we have one million periods over a single second. This of course means that one period takes only one millionth of a second here. As you see, there are so many zeros to express this in, even in order of seconds, that it is not practical anymore. Is that engineers show instead these small values expressed in microseconds, where one micro is stands for a millionth. So this is what this Greek symbol stands for. This is the micro symbol. Since it is not so easy to write this in several text editors, often you're gonna find that people just gonna write US instead. Now when it comes to switch mode power supplies, the frequency range what we use most of the time is actually between these two extremes. So roughly it is in the upper audio frequency range and it is in the lower radio frequency range. And this is why in most of these data sheets you might find things expressed in milliseconds or you might find them expressed in microseconds because it is up to the given engineer what they prefer to use. In today's video we have looked at periodic functions. As an example we have talked about the AC line voltage and now we should be able to understand what is the period of a periodic function or why we even call it a periodic function. I can tell you that it is really easy now to use a oscilloscope later because we're gonna have a better understanding of what should this time base be here which is the y-axis, namely the time axis on the oscilloscope have to be set in the same range what the real signal have time base. Since this video is running about 15 minutes ago, I would say that I will postpone the real signal used for pass fit modulation and also then in the follow-up video we're gonna discuss about controller chips used for pass fit modulation. Many thanks for watching, see you then in the next video.